Now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the hardware options for the UCS. So first of all, we'll take a look at uh, various fabric interconnects. We'll also take a look at the UCS uh, B series uh, blade chassis. You can always think B for blade. And the C series is the rack mount or pizza box server. Inside the blade chassis, we'll take a look at various IO modules or fexes, fabric extenders. And by the way, you'll see these referred to primarily as IOM or IO modules. Uh, but in some of the older documentation, you will see this referred to on Cisco.com as a fax because it truly is a fabric extender. We'll take a look at the various, some of the various blade servers and their options. In fact, uh, there's a plethora of blade servers and various CPU, RAM, and hard drive options along with different adapter cards or mezzanine cards. We'll also look at the C-Series server, its CPU, memory, and hard drive, as well as they're really not mezzanine cards for the C-Series. They're really uh, PCIe cards. So first of all, looking at the fabric interconnects and LAN and SAN connectivity, uh, we've got some older models. They are the 6120 and 6140. These have a latency of 3.2 microseconds. They uh, support 1 or 10 gigabit Ethernet. And they, if you want to support fiber channel connectivity, you need a gem or a generic expan expansion module, excuse me, uh, to be able to support those FC ports. Now the second digit in these uh, model numbers, 6140 or 6120, uh, that second digit, the one, is really the generation number. And that's what you'll see most of the time with the UCS platform. Whether we're talking about fabric interconnects, the main brains, or the I.O. modules, etc. So then there's the 6248 and 6296. And these are what are referred to as unified port fabric interconnects. And these are the current models. They have a two microsecond latency, so 1,200 um, nanoseconds was shaved off. And they have either a one or 10 gig ethernet or one, two, four, or eight fi uh, fiber channel connectivity option. And we have a uh, basically a very simple slider on the GUI, or we can of course do it from command line. Uh, and this is very similar to the Nexus 5000, specifically the uh, 5548 uh, uh, or any of the UP models that actually have the ability to uh, choose the upper end of the port numbers as fiber channel ports and the lower end as Ethernet ports. And of course, these fall on a uh, switch port ASIC boundary. So if a, if an ASIC, com and, and in the fabric interconnects it does, if an ASIC controls uh, two ports, then you're only going to be able to choose, you know, let's say ports 1 through 10 are Ethernet and ports 11 through 32 are fiber channel, but you cannot choose it on an odd port boundary because of that uh, two port ASIC commonality. So moving on from the brains of the operation, the fabric interconnects down to the uh, really the I.O. modules, uh, what allow the input and output out of the chassis, but what is contained within the chassis. We have the 2104 XP I.O. module. This is an older model. It has 0.8 uh, microseconds of latency or 800 nanoseconds of latency. It has four 10 gig e ports northbound to the FIs and it has eight 10 gig e ports southbound to the blades. Since there's two I.O. modules per chassis, this basically means that you can have up to, uh, since there are four 10 gig e ports northbound to the FIs, and we have two of them, and they are both active in the data plane, we can have 80 gigabits of chassis bandwidth northbound to the FIs. We can have two 10 gig e ports uh, per half width blade, one per I.O. module. Uh, so however many traces are there or however many uh, paths, the DCE paths, the uh, 
adapter or mezzanine card supports the IO module support up to two per half width blade, one per IO module. So 20 gigabits per half width blade up to the pair of IO modules. A newer model is the 2204, so the second gen, that second digit, 2204 XP. This has uh, half of a microsecond of latency. It still has four 10 gigi northbound ports, uh, but it's literally doubled its southbound port count to the individual blades. And this one also supports port channeling. So since there's two IO modules per chassis, this means that we can have 80 gigabits chassis bandwidth northbound to the FIs and four 10 gigi ports per half width blade. So we can have two traces that swing and we'll take a look at a lot more of this uh, in a uh, physical architecture diagram here in a moment. Uh, so don't worry if you're not exactly following along with what I'm saying. But we can have two traces or 20 gigabit per half width blade per IO module. Okay, so we can have 20 gigabit uh, swinging up to, fabric, uh, to IO module A and 20 gigabit swinging up to IO module B. And of course, IO module A connects to fabric interconnect A and IO module B connects to fabric interconnect B. So there's the 2208 uh, XP IO module. This is a current model. It has half of a nanosecond of, I'm sorry, half of a microsecond of latency. Half a nanosecond would be really fast. Uh, eight 10 gigi ports northbound, so twice as many as the 2204. So you, as you can see, that last digit uh, indicates how many northbound ports from the IO module to the fabric interconnect. It supports four times that amount southbound. So 32 10 gigi ports to the individual blades. It does support port channeling up to the FIs. And since there's two IO module, this means 160 gigabits per chassis, uh, bandwidth northbound to the fabric interconnects, and up to eight 10 gigi ports per half width blade, so four per IO module. And again, because these are active active in terms of a data path, uh, we really can use up to 80 gigabit per half width blade uh, load balanced across the two fabric interconnects, obviously assuming that we have multiple operating systems probably running on a hypervisor of some sort, uh, we can use all of that bandwidth. And if we have a full uh, width blade, that has two mezzanine cards and specific models have, uh, you know, specific number of traces up to the IO modules. We'll take a look at those as well. But assuming we have something called a VIC 1280 uh, and we actually have a full width blade, so we have two VIC 1280s, then we could potentially use all of the bandwidth for the chassis or at least have available all of the bandwidth for the chassis to one full width blade. So 160 gigabit for one full width blade, probably not the application that you'll be using, but it is an option should you need that in whatever particular use case. So taking a look at some of the blade servers and the mezzanine adapters, there are various models and benefits to the blade servers and mezzanine adapters. There are half and full width blades as I've already alluded to. Some of the mezzanine adapters are available from companies such as Emulex or QLogic. And when Cisco first started Project California, that was uh, really what was available to you, was um, adapters from Emulex or QLogic. You picked your you know, favorite vendor or driver support. Since then, Cisco came out with their own adapter and they called it Project Palo. Uh, this is also known as the VIC card or the virtual interface card. And the reason it's called a virtual interface card is because unlike the Emulex and QLogic uh, adapters, it does not have its own real physical ports. Instead, it is a FEX itself. So we've already talked about a little bit, and we're gonna you know, talk more about uh, the FEX architecture from the fabric interconnects down to the I.O. modules. But now we're actually talking about fabric extender technology from the fabric interconnects down to the adapter. Now it's not a kind of a cascading child effect 
from the FIs to the IO modules and then to the adapters. It truly is from the FIs to the IO modules and then also from the FIs down to the adapter level or the mezzanine level. We call it a mezzanine because it is actually a riser card that lies flat and rises up and connects to the half width or full width blades in the chassis. Uh, but whenever we create a NIC or a VNIC, a virtual NIC, or a VHBA, which really we'll also see is a VNIC itself because it's using fiber channel over Ethernet, uh, these do not get created, or I should say these do not, these are not physical interfaces on the card as they are with the Emulex and Q Logic. With the Palo or Vic card, they are not. They are uh, virtual representations of interfaces, and those interfaces actually get created on the fabric interconnects themselves in the form of VETH ports. So instead of an Ethernet port, which we have as well, those are physical ports, we have VETH ports or virtual Ethernet ports. And by the way, just as a kind of a little bit of an aside, um, I'm wondering, do you know how to virtualize just about anything in your data center? It's real simple to virtualize anything in your data center. All you have to do is add a V in front of the name. <laughs> A little bit of uh, virtualization humor and levity there, but it's uh, in some ways, obviously creating the actual uh, virtual architecture is a little bit harder than that. But in terms of anything that we, you know, are going to name, pretty much we will just simply put a V in front of that and it becomes a virtual entity. So VETH being a virtual Ethernet port. We're going to take a look in depth at the actual NXOS architecture in the fabric interconnects for the UCS system uh, when we get to the first part of LAN connectivity. Okay, so this will uh, become a lot more clear not only in diagrams, but also in command line. In terms of what various blades and mezzanine adapters are available, there's really too many to list here. So let's bring over our web browser. And we're going to go up to Products and Services, Unified Computing. And we'll see that we have uh, Blade Server information here. So let's take a look at the individual Blade Servers. I'm going to go to Compare Models here. And we see that we've got a number of different modules. The B22M3, or Generation 3. The B200M2 the newer B200M3, the B250 Extended Memory, B230M2, 420M3, and the 440M2. So we have a real quick table here that uh, at a quick glance helps us understand how many processor sockets, most of these having two uh, processor slots, multiple cores per processor, uh, some of them having four slots, the supported architecture of the processor. So we've got the Intel Xeon E5 2400, the 5600, uh, some of the newer ones have E7 2800, the E5 4600, and you can look up those individual uh, processor architectures on intel.com. We see the memory capacity, so how much memory they have. Some of them can hold uh, terribly dense amount of memory, uh, 48 DIMMs on the B420M3, up to uh, 1.5 terabytes of memory. We see how many, so two or four, uh, two and a half inch, uh, small form factor SAS or SATA, SATA, or even uh, SSD solid state drives that the individual servers can hold, what the maximum internal storage is, what possible integrated RAID levels we have. So for instance, on our B22M3 and our B200M2 uh, blades that we have, we can do either RAID 0 or 1, but when we go up to some of the uh, higher full width blades, we can see that they can do uh, RAID 5 and RAID 1 plus 0, or even RAID 6 in some cases. 
how many mezzanine adapter slots. Again, they'll have two slots if they're a full width blade. And this should tell us down here the form factor if these are half width or full width blades. The last two are full width and so is this one here and that's why they have two mezzanine adapter slots. So what are the max servers per chassis? So this is if you're using all of the same type and this really just has to do with the width of the blade. So if I have uh, only half width blades then obviously I can have eight uh, blades in my eight port chassis or eight slot chassis. If I have all full width blades I can only have four or of course I can have a mixture of those. I could have six half width blades and one full width blade. And then the ever so important IO throughput. So I can have up to two times 40 gigabits per second. And this is really gonna play into uh, not only the model of the server, but then also the model of the mezzanine card. So what mezzanine card is installed? And, and of course there's gonna be a compatibility of what mezzanine card is supported on which blades. So here I've got two times 40 gigabits per second. So this is going to make sense if I have the newer 2208 XP IO module where I have 32 southbound facing 10 giggy ports per IO module or four southbound ports per, uh, per IO module. So I've got 40 gigs times two because I'm going to have the ability to have two IO modules or two ports on my uh, two backplane links on my virtual interface card. So let's go back and we'll take a look. Uh, we'll skip over the rack servers. We'll come back to those in a minute, but keeping in line with the blade servers, let's go take a look at the virtual interface cards. So we'll show products and compare models on any one of these. And we're gonna see that we have virtual interface card here on the left tab. And then on the middle and right tab, we have two interface adapters and four interface adapters. So we'll look at two interface adapters real briefly. And we're not gonna to spend too much time on these. These are uh, much older models that really you, you might see still in production, but um, these are Ethernet, really Ethernet only um, interfaces. Now the, the Intel M61KR says that it'll have fiber channel support in the future, so but they don't have any fiber channel. So these are really uh, Ethernet only devices. So they have two ports, one to each IO module. And then the possibilities are there for them to have VMFX. So what is VMFX? This is uh, at a very high level, this is a fabric extension down into the actual virtual machine of the hypervisor. So of uh, most traditionally of VMware, but certainly support in the future for Hyper-V and things of that nature. Zen server, OpenStack, whatever. So failover handling. Can these fail over? And we haven't really talked much about this, but can these fail over in hardware is what this question is asking. So in doing that, let me just bring this link back up and let's talk real briefly about failover in hardware. So one of the things that we're going to see as we're going about configuring everything in the actual UCS manager is the fact that um, the the blade chassis itself, really the virtual interface on the hardware card, oops, is going to be responsible for the ability to be able to, clearly I'm not clicking the right thing because I can't draw here. Let me just shut that app and open it back up. So in the interface card itself is where we're going to have the ability or not to be able to, if a particular uh, link dies, either the, the trace, which would be the probably the least likely thing, the virtual port uh, or physical port on the virtual interface card rather, uh, the port on the IO module upstream, whatever link it might be pinned to, if we're dealing with something called uh, static pinning on the uplink, at any point all the way up to the fabric interconnect and anything that it's aware of, if we lost that link, 
can the virtual interface card or converge network adapter fail over to the other I.O. module in hardware, not requiring the uses of any software? And first of all, can it support it? And that's what we're taking a look at now. And then later, the question also has to be asked, is it configured for it? And then later you might even, or we might even ask, and we will address the question, would you want to use it? And the answer, of course, is sometimes yes and sometimes no, but we'll talk a lot more about that in the LAN switching section. So first of all, does this network adapter or mezzanine card support failover in hardware? And this particular one does. The others would only support it via a software bonding driver in the OS. So all of the four port or four interface adapters do support um, uh, software VM effects only. They support failover, two of them via software only, and that is the Emulex and QLogic M72, and the M71 Emulex and QLogic support it in hardware. And the KR at the end of this card, that is for 10 base KR. We're going to talk more about that in LAN switching, but it's a standard, uh, basically it's backplane Ethernet 802.3 AP, and it follows the same physical specifications that uh, 802.3 clause 49 states for long uh, 10 base LR, ER, and SR uh, physical specs. But at any rate, they have the ability to fail over in hardware. Now, in these cards, the M71, that's the first gen, the M72, that's the second generation. So why would the first generation support hardware failover and the second generation doesn't? So if you want failover, you have to have the OS aware and able to provide this. And by the way, when we say failover in hardware, we mean that the OS can be completely agnostic and completely unaware of any failure situation and hardware will take care of that failover dynamically in, in real time. There's no notification to the operating system that connectivity was lost. So uh, everything is, is dynamic and immediate if configured. So why would there be support in the generation one and not in the newer generation two? Well, this actually has to do with the Menlo chipset that is present on generation one, basically Cisco got together with Emulex and with QLogic and said, let us help you. We're gonna put our ASIC on your cards if you'll let us, and they did of course, and uh, we're gonna work in conjunction with you. And you know, just like anything, at some point Cisco decided that they can probably do a better job, so they pulled that Menlo chip out and they built their own, what's called the Palo card. So this is on the virtual interface card. Uh, we see the older M81KR and P81, and we'll talk about the differences between those two in a moment. But the four interface adapters, Emulex and QLogic continued making their adapters. Their generation two does not have that Menlo chipset, and so that is why uh, it's not supported with Cisco's hardware failover inside the chassis to the other I.O. module. So. I don't really see a lot of good reason to use these cards, but that's just me. I'm sure there's probably some use cases out there. At any rate, they have two Ethernet and two fiber channel. So when we're going to talk about a little bit later in the LAN switching and fiber channel switching sections, we're going to talk about what we create in the actual UCS manager, and then we're going to go create it as well, of course, and put it into action. And those are going to be called VNIX and VHBAs, virtual NICs and virtual HBAs or virtual host bus adapters for fiber channel. And the reason that we're gonna create these is we have the ability with these virtual interface cards, instead of just two ethernet interfaces or two fiber channel interfaces, as we click over to this link or this tab, we can see that the maximum interfaces for VNIC or VHBA are on the older cards 128 or on the newer cards 256. Now again this has to do with how many uplinks from the IO module to the fabric interconnect there are unless I have eight on each IO to FI then I can't have the full 256 and these 256 have to be broken down 
and, and really split up between VNIX and VHBAs. But at any rate, I have the ability to create all of these dynamic virtual NICs. Now, why would I want to? We're going to see when we get into the Nexus 1000V, and that will become very apparent when we talk about VMFX, or Virtual Machine Fabric Extension. Basically, this is the ability to present, and whenever we talk about virtual NICs or virtual HBAs, we're going to talk about presenting something to the operating system. Uh, how it thinks, and this is by way of standard PCI virtualization, and I'll remind you of that later, but by way of standard, industry standard PCI virtualization, um, we can present the operating system with a network adapter, and in the same way that if I were to spin up any sort of a disk with a standard, uh, let's just say, spin up any sort of an operating system on a VMware ESX host or ESXi host, the operating system that's running on top of that ESXi, the guest, it's as long as I'm presenting it with a E1000 uh, adapter in ESXi, then the OS on top just thinks that it is presented with a standard Intel NIC, right? And so it's completely unaware of the fact that that is, uh, that's not a real network card, or at least it's not a one-for-one -one mapping. I could create, you know, 12 virtual switches in uh, VMware ESXi, and prevent, present 12 virtual NICs to a guest OS, and it is none the wiser that those aren't 12 physical NICs. It thinks they are, it treats them as they are, and this really is going to be the same principle that we're going to use here in the UCS Manager. In fact, as we go on and talk about UCS Manager, we're going to talk about the real, one of the real powers of it, is in its virtualization capabilities, in its complete hardware abstraction. So we're going to present these dynamically created uh, virtual NICs or virtual HBAs to not only possibly the host OS. So let's say we're, you know, creating, uh, we'll talk about later some recommended practices for how many virtual NICs to create for various OSs, but let's just say we're presenting ESXi with, let's say, six or eight virtual NICs for various reasons that we'll discuss. I'm not going to get too deep into them right now. Uh, but beyond that, I want to present virtual NICs directly to the guest OS on that machine, bypassing the hypervisor switching altogether. And that's basically what VMFX is. And I'm going to draw this out, but we're going to be presenting NICs from the hardware of the UCS blade directly to the virtual machine guest without actually going through the hypervisor. That's basically what VMFX is. And so we're going to need to have multiple, I don't know about 256, but I'm sure that there have been use cases for that. Uh, we're going to need to have multiple virtual NICs beyond just what we present to the host OS of ESXi. And so that's the reason for all of these virtual NICs. So failover for all of the, and, and all of the virtual interface cards are going to be Palo cards. So it started out with the M81KR. Um, this is for the Blade series. And the P81E, we can see this is for the UCS rack servers. In fact, this uh, down at the bottom, it tells us which server compatibility. So if we want to have, for instance, the uh, VIC 1280 or 1240, the 1280 can be on a UCS M2, and it tells us the two car, uh, two blades that it can be on, or M3. The 1240 can be on an M3 server, and the older M81KRs can be on the UCS M2. Now, specifically on the exam, as we took a look at earlier, they list that they have uh, B200 M2 blade servers, but they also list that they have the Palo Mezzanine card and Emulex Mezzanine card. So of the Mezzanine cards, if we go back to the four interface, they're going to have an Emulex card of either the UCS 71, M71 or M72. I would imagine it's probably the M72, but it could be the M71. We'll just have to see when we get there, I suppose. And 
the virtual interface card, it's going to be a B200 M2. So that's going to be uh, most likely the M81KR virtual interface card. And again, we'll refer to these cards uh, colloquially as the Palo cards. You'll see those referred to in various blogs and mailing lists and Cisco support forums and things like that. The form factor for these, this says that this is a mezzanine card. Uh, the ones that can go on the rack servers can be PCI Express, or if they're full width, uh, full, full width cards, they could be PCI Express half height. Uh, the ones that just go on the rack servers, the P81E, this is a PCI Express uh, full height card. It gives us the various network throughput. So the older cards had 20 gigabit per second. So basically one 10 giggy uplink to each IO module. The 1240 designates four, uh, the 40 designates 40 gigabit per second. So two uplinks to each IO module. Or if I have the port expander card, then I can actually have up to 80 gig. And then the 1280 has 80 gig. So 40 gigabit or four 10 gig ethernet uplinks to each IO module. And that's where we get the uh, math and that we talked about with the 2208 XP. It has, uh, as we mentioned, it has eight uplinks to its FIs, but it has 32 southbound facing ports or four 10 gig e ports per half width blade, giving us the 40 or four 10 gig e ports per IO module for a total of 80 or eight 10 gig e ports per blade. So we'll go back. And I, I guess I should mention before I hit back one too many times, these don't list whether they support Ethernet or fiber channel. And that's because they're true converged network adapters. They are supporting 256, uh, again, VNICs or VHBA. So we'll be defining those as we go along. But I just wanted to point out, uh, since someone just asked the question, why they're not showing on the table for Ethernet or fiber channel explicitly, they're showing that here in the VNIC or VHBA, okay? We decide how many fiber channel, we decide how many ethernet, and then we decide are they used by the host OS or guest OS is running there. So in other words, are we doing VMFX or not? So we'll go back, let's take a look at the fabric interconnects and compare models. We've really looked at these uh, models, but here we have the 6248. Notice that we have a 960 gigabit per second uh, throughput. And if I bring up a calculator again, uh, if we have 48 ports times 10 gig E times two for full duplex, that's where the 960 number comes in. And of course, that 960 times two is our 1920 gigabit or 1.9 terabits per second uh, for the double port density 96 port unified ports. Okay, and it also says how many uh, expansion modules. We can have one expansion module uh, that brings us up to 48 ports, or in the 6296, we can have three expansion modules, but these bring us up to that max port count. We see the fabric extenders or the IO modules. Okay, so again, what the uh, throughput is for these particular devices. It tells us how many server facing ports, as we mentioned before, 32, 16, and 16, or how many, um, how many uplink ports to the FIs and the total throughput. So there's obviously oversubscription going on here if we have 32 server facing ports, but only eight uh, uplink FI facing ports. And, and then it, here's a model comparison, really the interface adapter with so the interface adapter at the top and along with the IO module here on the left and right. We can see the maximum overall bandwidth. We can also see what's supported and what's not. So for instance, a VIC 1240 is not supported with the older 2104. And what blades they're supported with. And last but not least, we just wanna take a look at the rack servers real briefly. So here are the older M2 servers, the generation two. 
and the newer M3. So I would be familiar with some of these in terms of what they're capable of for the data center written exam. And I don't think you have to know every single spec, but it would be good just to have some high level overview. I would certainly know the specs on the, uh, the B series. Okay, I'll take some questions. What's the cable type between the IO module and the fabric interconnect? These are small form factor pluggables or SFPs. So they can take the SFP Plus, which is the Twin X cable sold by Cisco. That's going to be by far your most cost effective cable and easy to cable. Um, but of course, they do take standard 10 giggy SFP uh, actual fiber modules as well. And then in terms of fiber channel, you need, of course, fiber channel specific. But those aren't going between the IO module and the FI, so you only ask between the IO module and the FI. Someone asked, shouldn't it be 2208 instead of 2108? Did I say 2108 or did it show that on the interface here? Let me go back. It says 2208. If I misspoke and said 2208, uh, or I, if, I, if I misspoke and said 2108, then yes, it should be 2208. Gen 2 is the only one that has eight ports. Someone asked if there was a Broadcom adapter on the UCS. Whoops, back one too many. If I go to virtual interface card, compare models, and the two interface then yes, I do see the Broadcom as an option as well. So this is two Ethernet ports, no fi fiber channel, uh, no hardware failover. Someone asked, what are the FET modules that come with the IO modules? The cables that come with the IO modules are the, at least in, if you're talking about the starter bundle, they are the SFP Plus. And if I recall correctly, I believe they're uh, one meter cables. Okay, are there any other questions? Probably not a whole lot of excitement here on the physical hardware, uh, but it's important to go over it because as we begin moving forward and talking about, especially about hardware failover, um, whether we tick the box or not, um, if we have a service profile error that we get because we tick a box for hardware failover and the device doesn't support it underneath, it's good to know why that might be. Um, it's also going to be important to know not necessarily how many uh, VHBAs or VNICs. That's certainly important for real life, but we're not going to be using anywhere near that amount in the lab. Um, but, you know, what we can do in terms of what supports VMFX, what supports hardware failover, and how many links are pinned northbound, not only for the written exam, but also for the lab exam as we go about configuring. So someone asked the question, the VIC-1240 and the VIC-1280 are different than the M71 and M72. That's absolutely correct. The M71 is the Emulex or QLogic. Actually, the M71 and 72 are both either, uh, they're either the dash E for Emulex or dash Q for QLogic, depending on the hardware manufacturer that created and spit those out. The second digit, the 71 or 72 is first gen versus second gen. And just remember that the first gen supports hardware failover. The second gen does not because Cisco decided to make their own. But yes, they are very different, completely different hardware architectures than the uh, M81KR or VIC-1280-1240 cards. These are all known as the Palo series. And these are the older, completely separate, independent manufacturer, Emulex and QLogic. All of the virtual interface cards are managed, uh, sorry, manufactured by Cisco directly.